Welcome to our study on the armor of God from Adirondack Baptist Church. In this series, Pastor Matt explains Ephesians 6 and how Paul instructs each believer to fight against the schemes of the evil one. Welcome back today to our series through the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. As you look around you at the world today, many of you are feeling the weight right now of evil, of injustices. We feel unrest and we see it personally and we see and experience it on a national level. But what I want to do today is take you back to Bible times for a second to help you see that injustice and sin and evil, it's been a part of our history for a very long time. In fact, in ancient Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, Isaiah has a scathing prophecy from God against them. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, Isaiah says this. This is the ESV. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear you. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue mutters wicked, wickedness. No one enters suit justly. No one goes to law honestly. They rely on empty pleas, they speak lies, they conceive mischief and give birth to iniquity. Their feet run to evil, and they are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Desolation and destruction are in their ways. The way of peace they do not know, and there is no justice in their paths. They have made their roads crooked. No one who treads on them knows peace. Does that sound like our world today? God describes his people as utterly devoid of righteous living. Yet, as we move throughout history, even in Paul's time in Ephesus, there were people who lived unrighteously. The city of Ephesus was known for the temple of Artemis and its pagan deity Artemis that they would worship. It was known for its use of magic and even emperor worship. And then, of course, moving today, we see so much evil around us. So why do I draw all these contexts together? You'll see soon, but specifically, all of these contexts describe people who are living unrighteously. And both contexts, as we'll see in a few minutes, relate to the armor of God. So in the midst of our sinful day and age, you as a Christian are to clothe yourself with righteousness, to stand out and contrast against the world. You must put on righteous living in order to stand against the devil's schemes. Look with me at Ephesians 6, verse 14. Paul says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Paul says to stand, not only by putting on truth, but now by putting on righteousness and righteous living. Like a breastplate that would protect a soldier's chest and lungs and heart, So Christians, so you, are to be clothed in righteousness. We hear a lot about righteousness and justice today, and so I want to answer two questions. Where does righteousness come from, and what does it look like practically? Because this is just such a short video, I want to refer you to a sermon that I preached back in July, entitled, What is Biblical Justice? You can find it on our church's YouTube page under Sunday Sermons, And I'll also provide a link in the description of this video. But before we answer these two questions, I want to give you a working definition of righteousness. Righteousness refers to the moral actions of a person, often expressed in charitable dealings with others, equitable decision-making, and conduct reflecting God's character. Righteousness involves showing mercy, being fair, and reflecting who God is. So let's explore those two questions. First, where does righteousness come from? Well, your righteousness is based on your position in Christ. Paul says that you are to be somebody clothed in righteousness. In the Bible, righteousness carries two senses. First, a positional righteousness, and then second, a very practical righteousness. In your position as a believer, God looks at you and declares you righteous. Paul says in Ephesians 4.24 that he put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Paul tells us as Christians to live righteously because we have actually put on righteousness. You see, when Jesus looks at us, there's no one righteous. No, not one. 
No one does good. Nobody seeks God, Paul says in Romans 3. He says no one's righteous. But Jesus came and lived a perfect life. When we get saved, turning to him in faith and repentance, God puts all of our sin on Jesus. And we, as Christians, are declared righteous by God because Jesus' righteousness is credited to our account. We stand in a position as righteous. God doesn't make us righteous at that instant, as Catholics say, and we are not working to earn our salvation. God says we, as sinners, are righteous because of what Jesus has done. So, we stand righteous in Jesus. But, the Bible does call us to righteous living. So, there is practical righteousness as well as positional righteousness. In Ephesians 5.9, the Bible says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. We as Christians are not only righteous in our position, but we should be righteous in our lifestyle. So, why should we be righteous? Where should this come from? Well, you as a believer have a God who is righteous. You as a believer have a God who delights in righteousness. And you as a believer have, have a Savior who has lived a righteous life so that we could have that righteousness in position. You have a righteous judge who declares us righteous. And you as a believer have a home in heaven where one day people will practice righteousness. Thus, we as Christians must live righteously in this age today. I used those two illustrations at the beginning of our time together, of Isaiah's day and in Ephesus, because they both relate to this concept of righteousness. In Isaiah's day, all Israel acted wickedly. But in Isaiah 59, 17, Isaiah says that Jesus the Messiah will put on righteousness. And this is where Paul draws his idea of the armor of God. In Isaiah 59, 17, it says this about the Messiah. For he will put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. And in the midst of a perverse world, Jesus himself puts on that breastplate of righteousness. And that's where Paul gets this idea from. Jesus, being the righteous judge, will condemn sinners and justify those who are humble and broken over their sin. Because our king is righteous, you too must be righteous. And in Paul's day, as I said, people lived after all sorts of gods and all sorts of beliefs, and they were not living righteously. So, because of your position as a believer, with a righteous king and a righteous judge and a righteous life, that's why you must be righteous. And true righteousness will thwart the devil's schemes and make the gospel attractive to unbelievers. So, we must be righteous, but what does this look like? In the time remaining, I want to talk about what righteousness looks like. The world throws around terms like social justice quite often, and sometimes they're spot on, but sometimes they're very off. So, what we need to do as Christians is look at what Scripture says is righteous, and then live accordingly. So, I want to give you a couple practical ways that we as believers must live righteously. And the first is we must care for the needy. In Matthew 25, 37 through 40, it says this, Then the righteous will answer Jesus, saying, Lord, when, when saw we the hungry and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When did we see you a stranger and took you in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and came unto you? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. There, there's many passages I could turn to about providing for the needy, but Jesus says that somebody who is righteous will take care of those less fortunate than others. A, a simple tenet of Christianity through the ages has been caring for those less fortunate than them and less, less privileged, if I can use that word. So how do you do it caring for those who are needy? in your personal lives, their needs, in your family, people in your church or in your community that you could bring food to or call for encouragement or spend time with or buy them something or do a project for them. On a larger scale, do you give some of your free time to volunteer at homeless shelters, food kitchens, or support financially various organizations that help the poor? We as Christians do righteousness as we help the needy. 
Second, righteousness looks like making fair and honest decisions. The Bible talks a lot about having just balances, having just scales. And scripture has a number of examples, like Isaiah 5, 22 through 23, which condemns kings who let the wicked go free and pervert justice. Justice is carried out as we make fair and honest decisions based on God's word. You all sit probably in some place of authority, whether your homes or your jobs or your ministries or in social settings. Do you show favoritism in the decisions that you make? Or are you fair? Not basing your judgments on whether or not you like somebody else better, but on whether or not the decision you make is according to Scripture. We as believers must make fair and equitable decisions. So, we live righteously by giving to the needy, making fair and honest decisions. And third, not using our authority for abuse or for our own gain. Paul in Ephesians and Colossians says that masters are to treat their servants well. Now, obviously, slavery is not an institution today, and especially in America, it was completely wrong. But in other situations in life, there's authority structures. Authority is not evil. In fact, God is our authority. Jesus is our Lord. And in the new heaven and new earth, there will be people that have more than other people. Inequity is not wrong. But abuse of inequity is sin. In your positions of authority, how do you treat others beneath you? The Bible does say that we are to lead like Jesus leads, whether that's our family, our our jobs, our schools, our ministries. In any position of authority, you must lead with equity because you ultimately serve the Lord Jesus. Fourth, Righteousness looks like ending oppression and speaking out against evils. Here's what Ezekiel 45 verse 9 says. Thus saith the Lord God, Let it suffice you, O princes of Israel, remove violence and spoil, execute judgment and justice, take away your exactions from your people, saith the Lord. The Bible clearly calls Christians to call out evil, to end oppressive systems, and call out uh, oppression when you see it in individuals. We should be vocal about calling out evil in society, whether it's on a large scale, present in systems or structures, or on a personal and individual level. So what does this look like? Well, it means we should speak out against things like abortion, against things like racism, against things like um, other abuses of power or untruth or when people are being unfair in society. It may look like on a small scale talking to your friends and family and your loved ones about sin in their life or about sin that they're dealing with. It might look like sharing a blog post online. On a large scale, it may look like joining a protest, something like a March for Life or an organization that seeks to promote the end of abortion. We must work to end large-scale oppression and abuses on a smaller level. Fifth, Righteousness looks like worship. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus describes acts like giving, like prayer, like fasting, as righteousness. Do you know that sincere acts of worship from your heart are described as righteous? So when you come to a worship service and are singing and giving and praying, that's righteousness. When you are at home and spend time with God in prayer and devotions, or when you give to the needy, that's righteousness. Now again, it must be done out of a true and sincere heart, not to be seen of by men, but Jesus says that is righteousness. And then finally, general Christian living is described as righteousness. In 2 Timothy 2.22, Paul tells Timothy to pursue righteousness. You and I as Christians are to pursue righteous living, and it, it should be something that we grasp at and strive after. So, You as a believer are to live righteously in order to fight against the schemes of the devil. In saying all this, you have to remember that our righteous living is not an attempt to usher in the kingdom of God. We know that Christ will return one day and make all things right. But because you and I are united to Jesus, and we are declared righteous, and we're citizens of a kingdom in which righteousness will reign, we are to live righteously in the time that God has allowed us on this earth. 
Now, many people might push back and say, well, that's a social gospel. Well, if we let it become a social gospel, it will be. But here's how Christ pictures righteous living. As we live righteously, and as we are sharing the gospel, people should look at our lives and say, that's what Jesus is like. And as they see what Jesus is like, we are telling them what Jesus is like. And one of two things can occur. Either they are drawn to Jesus and say, yes, I want that same king that they have. Or they persecute us for righteousness sake. We are to be lights in the world by living righteously, all the while fervently proclaiming the gospel. And what happens? Well, we resist the schemes of the devil. You must put on righteous living in order to stand against the schemes of the devil. I do want to thank you for joining me today as we've looked at this theme and topic of righteous living. As I said before, this is a shorter video and hopefully geared a little bit more practically, but if you want a more in-depth study of the topic of biblical justice and biblical righteousness, check out the sermon link that I provided below. Until next time, I hope you have a good week. Thank you for joining us today. For more information about our church and what it means to be saved, please check out our website at adirondackbaptist.com or visit our Facebook page. We love to hear from you.